Today is Saturday, September 20th, and we're here to talk about brain-based learning, focus on exceptionalities. And today's session is hosted by Dr. Denise Collins, Dr. Peggy Simmingson, and Dr. Amber Brown. And welcome. So go ahead and type a greeting and let us know how you heard about the session. And if you want to let us know what program you're in or if you're teaching, you can type that as well. So let's give everyone a few seconds to type a greeting, how you heard about the program, and what you're currently doing at the moment. And we'll type our greetings in too. And we're so glad you're here today on a Saturday. Give you guys a few more seconds to type a greeting and let us know who you are. Great, we've got some science and math people, STEM teachers. Excellent, first year teachers, we're so happy you're here. You teach, Dr. Brown, heard from Dr. Brown, excellent. And we also have our department chair, Dr. John Smith, on board. If you want to say hello, Dr. Smith, let us know. We've got some elementary people, hello. elementary people. Hello to everybody. This is John, and I'm grateful to be here, and I'm especially appreciative of Doctors Semington, Semington, Collins, and Brown, and for their efforts in putting together the information and presentation, and I expect that we will all benefit greatly from being here. Thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you. Okay, just a reminder, um, these are our opinions and suggestions. They don't necessarily re reflect the viewpoints of the University of Texas at Arlington. And our goal is to have you hear a variety of ideas to help you become better teachers. So we offer support, respect for what you do, and each other. We want dialogue, and you can type in the chat window as a way to communicate. You can ask questions, and we'll be sharing information. Remember, if you have no people who want to see this recording, it will be posted to YouTube later this weekend, and the PowerPoint will be on SlideShare. So this is part of the Teacher Induction Project, Building Digital Community. It's open access. There's mobile access. It's Web 2.0, meaning you can interact. And we have real world topics for teachers. Again, the recordings are available in various places. Um, we also have social media. I'm typing all of those into the chat window, and so you can access those after the session. We have a Facebook page for interaction and updates and community. SlideShare, where we post PowerPoints, and YouTube, where we post recordings. We hope you can join us on November 1st, where we'll be talking about understanding autism. It'll be the same time, 1 p.m., and the link will be shared soon. And then we're really excited about November 22nd. We have a guest speaker from engineering, Dr. Dan Popa. I'm going to type his name in. And if you just Google him, Dr. Dan Popa, you can learn more about his programs. He has a robot named Zeno who helps with um, intervention for autistic children. And he's a little itty-bitty robot. He's not super huge. He's probably, I don't know, a foot tall. And we'll hear more about his technologies that are really helping to understand and intervene with children. And then we have a book club discussion on Goodreads. Call, uh, from the book The Autistic Brain, and we'll hear a little bit about that today from Dr. Colin. So again, ask questions, and then main Q&A is at the end. We encourage you to make a list of things to Google later. You might hear new ideas, and so note taking is encouraged, whether you're typing on an iPad or a pen and paper. Um, again, we'll check the chat window, and if we're not speaking, one of the hosts can interact with you in the chat window, too. OK, this is always fun. Tell us where you are. So use the pen tool to put a little x or a dot where you are, and a small x. If you want to, you can also type it in the chat window. Let's give us a few seconds to let everyone know where we're coming from. The pen tool is the third button down on that 
bar of icons right next to the chat window. I think many of us are from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And I'm looking in the chat window, Burleson, Bedford, Fort Worth, Grand Prairie, Euless, Roanoke, Louisville. Anybody from outside of the Dallas-Fort Worth area? Let's see, sometimes we get people from other places. Mansfield. Let us know where you are. Let's see where our community comes from, this digital community of teachers. Colleyville, Mansfield, Arlington. Baytown, is that near Houston? So welcome. Okay, this is that's always fun. So I think we're mostly in this area, but we have someone, I think, from the Houston area. Great, Jackie's joining us. Okay, we're going to do a quick poll, and we usually do this every time. And so go ahead and vote. It's next to the hand tool in the participants window, and it's actually under my name where it says moderator, and you can vote A, B, C, D, or E. Where are you in your teaching career? A, pre-service teacher, B, first through third year teacher and UTA graduate, C, first through third year teacher and non-UTA graduate, fourth year teacher or faculty or none of the above. So it's next, it's to the right of the hand tool. Let's see where we're at. Give us a few more seconds to vote. The voting tool is just to the right of the hand. And I'll show the results in just a minute. I think many of us are pre-service teachers today, but we've got some new teachers and we've got some experienced teachers. Let's see, I need to vote. Got some faculty on here too, that's great. Okay, let's see where we're at. So mostly um, pre-service with some first through third year teacher and some first through third year teacher non-UTA grad and a fourth, couple of fourth and above year teachers. So great, thank you. It's good to know where we are. Let's practice using the text tool. It is the fourth button down and we're gonna have you type on our live slide the great interaction tool. So go to the fourth button down and click on the A, and then click on the A again to create text, and then you can start typing into the box. If you're attending by phone or iPad, type in the chat window as an alternative. So to practice using the text tool, type a sentence about teaching and learning in the box below using the text tool. So the, go to the little skinny strip, Go down to the fourth button, click on the box, and then click on the A, and then start typing in the box itself, or type in the chat window anything you want to say about teaching and learning. If you want to add your name, you can. So I typed a sentence in the box. Let's just practice using this tool. Some, a couple people are typing in the chat window, so you can do either one. Just give us a minute, and I'll help move things if they overlap. Dr. B shared, and then just read what other people wrote. Dr. Collins said, I love focusing on the brain to understand children and why they behave the way they do. Dr. Brown says, teaching requires continuous learning. Learning is lifelong. And that's kind of why we're here, right? Always learning. Teachers must always be willing to teach and learn. They go hand in hand. These are great ideas. And in the chat window, we've got, there's so much ideas to teach a subject. Teaching is learning by practicing. That's true. Learning should be fun. Love it. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Dr. Smith, teaching and learning are inextricably connected, connected and supportive. Good advice. And then many styles is very true. Okay, great. Give us a few more seconds. Teleporting should be engaging. Okay, what else? Anything else you want to add? I'm going to go to the next slide and we'll do one more live slide where we type with text, either in the chat window. 
let's get ready to learn and then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Collins in just a few seconds. So again, let's do a live slide. What do you know about the brain and learning? Let's give us a minute to type our ideas. Type it using the text tool or type in the chat window if you don't have access to the text tool. And no one needs to worry about spelling today. You can also change your font size and color. And if you don't feel like typing, you can just read what people are writing on the live slides or in the chat window. If you don't use it, you lose it. <laughs> it's important to use many different methods so different areas of the brain can be exercised. The more you practice it, the more you learn it. I pit students process information differently. Our brains are fascinating learning machines, that's true, and kind of the, an, an unexplored territory to some degree. Um, learning occurs through gaining information and storing it in the long-term memory. Learning changes the brain and can, let's see, let's make this bigger, something throughout the lifespan. Can, and can throughout the lifespan, that's true. Okay, great. We're, I'm going to go ahead and turn it, get ready to turn it over to Dr. Collins, and we're going to hear more about her. She'll introduce herself. Got different learning styles. Thanks, everyone. Hi, um, I'm Dr. Collins, and um, I have been in this field for a very, very long time. Not even going to mention the years, but. Um, um, recently, within the last eight years, I've been at University of Texas at Arlington. My specialty is child development, and um, I have recently, over the last three years, really gotten into this whole idea of understanding the brain and how to use that in our teaching techniques. I'm very excited to share this with you. So let's talk, first of all, so let's talk first of all, about um, some ideas that we're going to cover today. Understanding exceptionalities first requires a basic understanding of how the brain works. So what we're really going to focus on um, in the future are the exceptionalities. What we're going to focus on today is um, basically looking at the developing brain so that we can better understand how it works. My first question is, why do we learn about brains? So type at least one response to the following question in the chat window. Why do you think it's important for teachers? I've got a little thing open here. I need to get out of the way. So um, so go ahead and type your answer to that question that you see there. See how this is coming. Oh, boy, we've got lots of good answers here. Let's look at some of these that are coming in. Uh, it makes teachers more efficient so we can understand how students learn and behave. This is the center that learning um, and retention occurs. Helps us understand how students learn, uh, to understand their behavior, absolutely. Um, so awesome, really good thoughts about this. Brain holds all the knowledge so they can meet the needs of all learners, so we can make sure each student is successful in their own way. We need to understand how to reach our students, so that's a, that's a great comment. To understand the kids' ability through the years, yes, good developmental comment. To accommodate our, our own teaching style, very good, so that we can foster learning. Uh, it, pulling in the latest brain research is definitely uh, important for us. And understanding the physiology of the human brain helps us to tailor our own instruction. 
to understand their skills. I love this because you've covered everything from the teacher's point of view to the child's point of view. And um, and that's both of those are very, very important as we're looking um, at brain development. So I wrote down just two comments here about why um, we need to learn about brains. And the first one is that if we understand the needs of the child and how the brain develops, then we will know how to create a respectful, nurturing environment. And um, I put this in here as my first thought because every time when we get down to the nitty gritty of teaching, it always comes back to the relationship. So unless we know how to have a relationship with our students, we're not going to be very good at helping them learn and understand the topics that we need them to learn. And the second one I put on there is that the child will then, if we understand this, that the child stays attuned and learns. And the teacher can focus on increasing learning rather than guidance issues. It's kind of These are really new thoughts because when I first got into teaching, just to show you how old I am in here, um, when I first got into teaching, it really was all about um, uh, giving your topic, talking about your subject. And we didn't pay attention to the fact that children learn differently. And we didn't pay much attention to the fact um, that that we have to help children move forward. It was all about it was all about the teacher, and it was all about sharing our information. And we didn't particularly care um, whether or not a child learned. Um, we didn't look at how that was important and why we needed to make sure that every child in our classroom was learning. So these are two really important issues about the brain and why we need to learn about that. So one of the things that we need to understand is what our ultimate goal is when we are working with brains and helping children to move forward. And that is brain integration. This is our ultimate goal. And there's a lot um, of information that we have to talk about here. But what I would like you to understand is that we're, we're, we're getting down to the very, very basics and having a few minutes to chat about it. And then we'll give you more resources to go in and learn more about this. But children basically need to gain the ability to stop and start themselves. They need to stay attuned to their emotions. And they need to focus on learning. And if we look at all of this and put it together, it is basically self-regulation is where we want children to get. Uh, the important thing here is that self-regulation takes a very, very long time, but it has to start from the time children are born and um, in very small steps. And the big focus in pre-K has to be teaching and learning self-regulation. And so again, getting children to stop themselves and start themselves without the teacher having to intervene, without the teacher having to say, everyone pay attention now, everyone sit still, everyone do this and do that. We need um, children to be able to get to the point where they can do that for themselves. So the next issue um, that's really important, I think, is that the brain is always looking for answers. So no matter what we do with our students and with our own selves, the important thing is here is that is that we're always looking for answers. So I put a little graphic up there. Um, and just what do you see here? What is this? How does your brain perceive this? So go ahead and type your responses in the chat window. And let's see uh, what kind of responses we get to. What is this? A valley, a TP village, two triangles and a line. Oh, cat's ears. Oh, OK, that's interesting. Lots of mountain answers. Two pyramids. Two triangles. So what's interesting about this is that everyone, oh, Dracula's mouth upside down. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and, and lots of people are perceiving this from a very, very different way. And that's well, why I put this up here is to just say that um, pumping eyes is that um, our our um, our ideas and our thoughts 
are all very different. So I'm going to give you the answer to what this is from my point of view. And it is two children wearing party hats walking behind a wall. So the idea why I have to tell you this is because if I didn't give you the answer, your brains will continue to think about the question. And it won't rest. And especially for you women, you will go to bed tonight and you will be thinking, Jay, I wonder what that really was. Um, and so we, I need to put that to rest for you and give you this answer. But the idea here is that um, we all basically have um, the same parts in our brain. We all have a prefrontal cortex. We all have an amygdala. We all have a hippocampus. And yet, all of our brains perceive things differently. So as we're teaching and as we're working with children, we never really know how they're perceiving the information that we are presenting to them. Now, yes, our brains are very complicated. They have a lot more parts to them than this. And my son, who is in neurobiology right now, is saying, Mom, come on. Um, these, are, these aren't even the most important parts. <laughs> and I said, well, I understand. but." Uh, for what we're learning right now, these are the three most important parts that we need to think about. And so let's look at what these actually do. So the amygdala is basically the security guard. The hippocampus is the memory keeper. And the prefrontal cortex is the leader. And why these are important is because of the way the brain develops and how it helps us to uh, learn in different ways. So the amygdala being the security guard, basically what happens, and when I'm doing this in a class, um, I have a really uh, interesting game that we play to get this point across. But, but I'll, I'll talk it through uh, here and just say that the amygdala is the security guard. And so anytime you perceive something new or different, um, the amygdala wakes up and says, what's going on here? And if the amygdala perceives um, through the hippocampus and past memories that it's a safe thing that's happening, then we can go forward and learn about it. And the prefrontal cortex can make some good decisions. But if the amygdala says, this is kind of scary here, I don't think I like this, um, or to the effect of, oh my gosh, we need to run. This is, this is really, really bad. Um, the hippocampus. Um, actually then, then we can't learn anything. And the hippocampus comes in and looks at all of the memories. So you see something new or something different. You see a big dog walking down the street. Um, if, you, um, if your hippocampus, as the memory keeper, says, oh my gosh, um, I got bit by a big dog when you remember that. You got bit by a big dog when you were two. You, you need to think about this. You need to do something different. Then the prefrontal cortex will perceive it very differently. If, however, you had a big dog growing up and you loved that big dog and you had good, good um, uh, relationships with that dog, then the memory keeper comes back and says, OK, this is a good thing. Go ahead up and pet the dog. You know, it'll send, actually send the information to the prefrontal cortex saying, this is safe, this is good. And the prefrontal cortex will make a very, very different um, decision saying, go ahead up and, and pet that dog. So that's why these three pieces are very, very important. So you can imagine a child sitting in a school classroom and um, they perceive that the teacher is going to hit them or scream at them or yell at them, the amygdala really will shut down the prefrontal cortex. The hippocampus will only remember that, oh my gosh, this is a bad situation. And it won't remember what you're going to teach. So that is why these interact in a very important way for us as educators in our classrooms. So how do all of these develop is important next, because we start with the brain stem down here, which the amygdala is, and you'll see in a minute on a video, the amygdala is basically in the middle here. And when, um, when we start to develop, the brain stem is the first thing that comes online, and then it moves forward and goes to the top of the brain. We also develop from the, from the back to the front. So again, all of this emotional stuff, everything that's happening here develops first. The prefrontal cortex does not develop until very later, very much later. 
And then we also have the right hemisphere developing before the left hemisphere, where they develop at the same time, but the right hemisphere really takes off in the early years and develops first, and then the left brain comes online. So why is this all important? If you look at the brain facts on the screen right now, it says that the right hemisphere is the emotional tsunami. And basically what happens is if we're in the right hemisphere, we're feeling emotion, 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 and we make decisions based on the feeling of that emotion. And if we look at this again and say the right hemisphere is developing way before the left hemisphere or way, way quicker, much quicker than the left hemisphere, it sort of helps you understand why two and three year olds throw temper tantrums. They have this emotional situation going on in their life and, um, and they can't think logically because the left hemisphere isn't online yet. Um, look at the left hemisphere, it's the emotional desert. The left hemisphere is all about logic. And when the two brains work well together, we have, we have some balance in our lives, some emotional balance. Uh, when we only have the right hemisphere um, sort of controlling our lives, then we throw temper tantrums and we, we react out of emotion versus reacting out of logic. The other thing that's uh, interesting is that the hippocampus forms around 18 months. And it actually will take the emotional data, combine it with the experience, and give us very explicit memories. So although we have feelings um, associated with things, they're not real explicit memories before 18 months. And we don't put this into long-term memory uh, until much later, some of us not until seven years of age. Uh, so if you think back about how far you can remember, that will sort of tell you when um, uh, the hippocampus was working really well to form, uh, uh, form those explicit memories. The prefrontal cortex is still developing at age 25. Typically for girls, it finalizes around 25. And for um, males, it's really around 27. So the important thing to remember here is that it is the leader. The prefrontal cortex makes our decisions for us. So think now about an adolescent uh, sitting in your classroom who is um, filled with all those emotional hormones that are running through their body, and now they have to go out and make a decision about how they should behave or how they should act. And we don't have a good leader yet formed, and so you can see why they make sometimes really poor choices in their lives because they base it a lot on uh, emotion or memories from the hippocampus. So the brain needs integration, and integration happens through experiences. And this is um, an idea that I got uh, from listening to um, Tina Payne Bryson and Dan Siegel speaking. And they talked about the idea that if you have a boat um, going down the river, what we really want is for that boat to go down the middle of the river and not crash into either one of the banks. For us, um, we have two banks, the bank of rigidity and the bank of chaos. And so our boat can crash into that. And so if things, um, you know, we're not going to work today. If things happen um, that can cause chaos in our lives, the boat's going to go down the river and crash into chaos. If, if, it, if something traumatic happens in our lives, we can, we can actually have our boat crash into rigidity or we can have our boat crash into chaos. Chaos in a classroom is a child who flips over a desk. It's a child who walks over to the shelving unit and just runs his arm across and knocks everything to the floor. Um, a rigid child is a child who comes into the room and says, I sit in this chair and you arrange the desks today and I can't deal with this. Um, I have to be, I have to know where everything is. Um, they will walk around the room and put everything on the shelves where it belongs. They will rearrange your shelves for you if you have changed them. They will put it back the way it was. 
uh, they can't get past the rigidity. And so what we want to do is we want to, and we all crash basically in these banks every once in a while, but we want this vote most of the time to float down through the middle of the river. And that is what we call brain integration when we can get through our day without going completely chaotic or going completely rigid. Um, and so um, we're going to watch uh, a video uh, from Dan Siegel. I would like to just though ask, did you have any comments or thoughts? I wasn't able to really watch the slide at the side, but are there anything, is there anything here that, or chinchillas, I love that, <laughs> um, that you would like to comment about at this moment that you have not, or a question that you might like to ask before we go ahead and watch this video from Dan Siegel? All right, so let's go ahead and watch the video. I think it's going to come up here in a second. I paused the web tour for a minute. If you are on a phone or iPad, you're going to need to watch it on your own and then join us in about 15 minutes. So about seven of you can watch it on your own. I'm sorry I paused it just for a second, Dr. Brown, and we'll get it back up in a minute. So if you're on a phone or iPad, you can watch it with the link. And don't, but please join us back again for the debrief. Okay, Dr. Brown, sorry, you can get it going again.
All right, Denise, do you want to wrap up? Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Brown. Okay, so what we have on the screen in front of you then is some um, different ideas, um, different places you can go to get more information. Um, I'm going to just share with you this um, book. Let's see if I can get it in front of me here. It's called The Whole Brain Child. It works with, um, it's, it's a parenting book actually that was written by Tina Brain Bry Payne Bryson. And um, all of um, some very, very basic ideas of concepts and how to deal with children in certain situations to develop their brain. So it's an excellent book if you are a parent or if you know um, of a parent that is just beginning to work with children in their brain. So that's really good. I think that, um, that interestingly, the things that, the comments that people said were very, very good. And the idea, especially I think for, uh, for us right now as we're, as we're grasping technology and trying to understand where technology comes into the classroom um, is, is the idea that it, it can replace them because the relationship has to be there. The relationship is important. The situation that we have is that we have people who think that, um, that putting children in front of TVs is going to help them to learn. It doesn't. TV is not a relationship. So I think it's very important to think about those kinds of things. Okay. Let's go All right. ahead and, and move forward, Amber. All right. I want to introduce to you something new we're trying this semester. Um, we wanted to keep the learning going in between our webinars. So we chose this book by Temple Grandin. And in, you may have heard of her. She's a very famous um, advocate for autism. And she, her most fundamental book she's written is The Autistic Brain, and it describes her experiences of being autistic before anyone really understood what that meant, and all of the advances and how she's learned about herself and learned about autism through um, medical advances and just her experiences. So it's a really, really interesting book. It's really easy to read. Um, it had, there's a lot of different options. There are Kindle versions. I'm reading the Kindle version right now. Or you can find it uh, pretty inexpensively on Amazon and half price books and places like that. I've also posted a link to the, uh, a TED Talk that she gave. And it's really interesting to watch her speak. So if you want to kind of get a taste of what um, her message is about autism before actually deciding to dive in, but we really want to encourage everyone to, to do this book. I know a lot of you are students and you have a million other things to do, but this is a really important um, chance to further your learning about autism. As a matter of fact, one of my seniors last night, I was going through their weekly reports, and she has an autistic child in her classroom, and one of her cooperating teacher was wanting her to learn more about how to deal with an autistic child so in the classroom. So it's something that you will experience eventually in your career. We're doing the book club through the website Goodreads. There's also apps for Goodreads. This link will take you directly to the, um, the group for UTA New Teachers. So once you sign up, it's a free account. Sign up for Goodreads and then follow this link and it will take you to our book club. And we will be posting questions um, as we have aha moments during the book reading. We want you to do the same. If you have questions, if you have just comments or um, moments that you thought were just really, wow, I can't, I'm so glad I've learned this, post them on this Goodreads discussion. And then on November 22nd, we'll come back together and wrap up the book club discussion. That's also the same day we're going to learn about Zeno, and I'm really excited to um, get to meet him. I've seen him sitting in his lab with all his other robots just sitting there doing nothing, so I'm really glad, excited to see him in action as well. If you have any questions or, you know, anything else about how to find the book club or anything, feel free to contact me. and. I'll try to get you pointed in the right direction, but UTA New Teachers is the group on Goodreads. This link will take you directly to it. 
Um, I see Peggy Simmingson, she uh, posted that in the chat window because this link isn't live, so you can't click on it. it will, the slideshow will be posted on SlideShare, so you'll be able to get it from there as well. And we look forward to all of your comments and all of your insights as you read the book, The Autistic Brain, with us. All right. Um, any final questions? I want to thank Dr. Collins again for all the fantastic information about how our brains work. I think that's the basis of learning. And once we really understand that, we can move on from there. Like I said, the next two sessions are going to focus on autism as an exceptionality to how the brain normally works, because um, we will, you will experience children with that. But any other questions specifically about this content right now that you want to ask us while we're on here? Like I said, I don't see any. No. Like I said, you can always email one of us. You can post a question on the or see in our Facebook page, and one of us will respond to you. I think um, several of uh, the professors at UTA check that frequently. So if you have any further questions or as you're reading some of these resources that we've provided, um, you have any other insights you want to share? Also, we want you to, um, like I said, keep responding. I know we're running out of time, but Keep responding with questions and things that you have learned or want to know more about. Just because this really ties in with what we're talking about, we want to remind everyone about our master's program in mind-brain education that we have here at UTA. It's really that intersection between education, neuroscience, and um, you know, so taking all those things about how scientists have learned how the brain works translating that into how that affects um, us as teachers. So it's a really um, great program. You can find more information about it on our website, but this is a little bit of information about it. This is Dr. Mark Schwartz is the um, director of that program. So here is his email that you can contact him about information. It's never too early to start thinking about your master's degree, even if some of my juniors on here don't even want to think about that yet. And thank everyone for attending. The last thing that I want to get to really quickly, and I'm kind of skipping through these last few slides, is we want to keep improving our webinars. We want to make sure that we're doing the best job we can do to provide information to our future teachers, our, current, our new teachers, um, you know, our former graduates, any teacher that's in, you know, in our community that wants to join. So we have designed a really short um, survey that will take, will give you some more information or give us some more information about your learning and your experiences during the, the webinars. So please, um, I don't want to sound like I'm begging, but I kind of am, <laughs> go follow this link and complete the survey. It won't even take 10 minutes. It's not even, it's I think 20 questions, but they're kind of, like your, you know, click this, click this, click this. Um, and even if you know someone who is planning to watch the recording, they can also complete the survey um, and just indicate that they viewed the recording, but they still will have a similar experience in gaining the content and information. So thank you. Thank you all for joining. I hope that you've learned a lot and you have a lot of um, ideas and things in your mind that you want to go Google later, as Dr. Simmingson mentioned, be sure to go to the survey and check out some of the resources that we've provided. Do Dr. Simmingson, Dr. Collins, do you want to make any last statements? No, thanks for joining us. We welcome your feedback. We hope you can explore some of the links and share any of the videos that were presented today. And again, Email any of us for questions. Also, we hope that you can like our Facebook page. We're on Pinterest. And again, resources pertaining to this video are on SlideShare and YouTube. So thank you. Again, the survey link is in the chat window. We hope you can click that link and take about 10 minutes to take this.
post-webinar post survey. We welcome your feedback. It helps us to make better um, sessions. If you have any more comments or thoughts, feel free to type them in the chat window. Facebook is for everybody. It's a way for us to get news out about the Department of Curriculum and Instruction. And it's just a great way to keep in touch. So please spread the word. And thanks for doing the survey if you have time to click and try it out. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Okay.